this way of inspiration. And we're going to start by reading the whole chapter 9 of John, because it's all one account. But I want you to pick out what is the main theme here. There's lots of themes in here, but what is the main theme of this chapter? John 9. We're in John 9, Daryl, and I got my mic on. Yep, I have that. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Radio program came across good this morning. Okay, good. And uh, back to the two week uh, uh, delay. Delay. Okay. One I did, didn't get recorded, so I didn't use one of your previous recordings. Okay. So we came back, so I got a two week. Okay. Which is not a bad thing. No, that's not bad. That's good. Good to have some backups. Okay, we're going to get into John 9, so let's get to John 9. I'm going to read the whole chapter, and again, try to figure out what is the main theme of this chapter. What? Sin. Well, sin's the main, a main theme of the Bible, but uh, let's see if we can get a little bit more focused into what kind of sin is being discussed here. Okay, John 9, verse 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is, by interpretation, sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came, seeing the neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that was uh, he that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and watch and wash. And I went and washed, and I received my sight. And they said unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. Okay. Who did they take this healed man to? (coughs) The Pharisees. Is that starting to tie in now with Mark? Okay. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight, and he said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. 
For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he, meaning Jesus, was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, He is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind, and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner, meaning Jesus. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remain. Okay, uh, what do you think is the main focus of that, main theme of that chapter? Uh, whether or not Jesus is in fact uh, the Son of God, I mean that's, that's the question that's coming, uh, that's being asked. Okay, that's, that's certainly a very major theme of the, of the uh, chapter, but what, what is going on here? What's the, what's the drama? What's the dynamic? The guy who was made, the guy who was blind who can now see, the question is, who did it? And um, is he God? Is he a prophet? Is he a sinner who is unable to do that? That's what it seems to be the debate. Okay, it's really, it's really a confrontation between who? The Pharisees and Jews. All right, that's, that's, that's the drama. The blind man is in between. He, he's, he's not the important thing here. The important thing is Jesus and the Pharisees. And this is what we see in Mark, isn't it? What's going on here? Jesus is God. Jesus is the Messiah. As he says here, I am God the Son. I am the Christ. The Pharisees didn't believe it, did they? They didn't want to believe it. Even though they saw this evidence right before their eyes, this man can heal a man who's never seen the light of day his whole life. Well, then again, what they were teaching, and they threw him out of church. Well, well right. They, they taught works righteousness. Yes. Uh, they were the leaders of the Jewish church. This is what was being taught in the Jewish church. Uh and in, in verse 30, you know, the man says, Why, hearing is a marvel. <laughs> Here you are the leaders of the church, and you can't explain that how this man opened my eyes for the first time in my life. 
Don't you understand? He's from God, or he's, he's not a sinner. Remember, Levi invited the publicans and sinners. This man eateth with publicans and sinners. And so they're classifying Jesus as a sinner, and in other words, an unbeliever, an ungodly man. Uh, so what are the Pharisees constantly trying to do? That's right. Trying to steer people away from Jesus in all of these things he just tried. What were you going to say back here? That's right. Find fault in him because if they can if they can pin a sin on him, they can do what to him? That's right. They would do that, and in the end, they want to. They hit him so much they want to kill him. They try to find something that has a capital offense to it. So that's the drama going on here. It's, it's Jesus and the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are hating Jesus, and Jesus is calling them the blind ones. And so what do the Pharisees think they can get him on? Healing the blind? Is that a crime? Uh, on, the Sabbath on the Sabbath day. That's see, It doesn't emphasize it, but it, boy, it mentions it right off the bat. Okay, that he, this was the Sabbath day. That's what they want to get him on. That uh, he did this work, what they called work. What was the work that he did? Yeah, he made, he made clay out of dust and spittle. And they, see, they, they were so technical in their, their minutia of the law, the commandments, the, in this case, the third commandment, that they thought, you can't even do that. That's, that's, that's work. Even though he did it to heal a sick man. This is what ties into our account in Mark chapter 2. We see throughout the New Testament Gospels, the Pharisees trying to get something on Jesus to accuse him so that in the eyes of the general population, they discredit Jesus. They get rid of him. He's steering people away from the Pharisees, steering people away from the established church. Uh, he's, he's turning people against them. They look at Jesus as an enemy that they try to get rid of. In uh, verse 16, we're talking about this division among the Pharisees. Do you take that to mean that some of those, some of them were doubting what the other Pharisees were saying, that maybe this man isn't a sinner? Right, they're, they're seeing the contradiction here. Uh, yeah, they're saying our, our position is untenable. Uh, the, the hard noses are saying, as you point out in verse 16, this man is not of God because what? What's our proof he's not of God? That's right. He keepeth not the Sabbath day. That's, that's the sin they're going to accuse him of. But then the other said, yeah, but look what he does. Look at the miracles, all the miracles he does that no man could ever do. As, as the healed man said, in the entire history of the world, nobody has ever done this. Taken a man born blind and opened his eyes to see. How can you say this is in God's hand? And some of the Pharisees are seeing this, like this is our position that he is not of God is untenable. So this is the, the, uh, the drama, this is the setting uh, the, as we go back to Mark, uh, picking it up in verse 23, uh, starting a new paragraph there. Now, the issue here is who is Jesus? The Pharisees, by and large, are claiming that Jesus is what? A man that's a sinner. Yeah, a, an unbeliever a godless man, a, a, a fake, a fraud, a, a deceiver, everything bad you can think of, because he's upsetting their apple cart. They're, they're 
their high standing in the community and their living and so forth. Uh, so they claim he's, he's not only just a man, he's an evil man. He's a demon-possessed man. Uh, that's the uh, story they're trying to feed the public. But actually, Jesus, by his miracles, is proving what? He's God. He's just the opposite. Yes, he's a man, he's a true man, but he is also God. He is, in fact, the Messiah. He is the promised God-man uh, from the Old Testament. And being God, can he break the Sabbath law? No. no. Well, he can't sin, but what he does shows it's not a sin that the Sabbath wasn't meant to be what these Pharisees and scribes had built it up to be. They turned it into something that was a yoke, that was a burden, that was a, uh, 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 an anchor upon people to keep them from doing necessary things on Saturday. That's right. They, they used it not as, as a good thing, as a blessing to man, which God meant it to be, but they had turned it upside down. We're going to use it as a club on people to keep them from doing what we don't want them to do. And so the main theme here in Mark, beginning in verse 23, is Jesus proclaims himself Lord, which is God, and therefore he is Lord of the Sabbath, and he will interpret the Sabbath the way God intends it to be interpreted, as a blessing to man, not a hindrance, which the Pharisees had turned it into. Okay, so that's what's coming up here in verse 23. So let's read verse 23. And it came to pass that he, Jesus, went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. Now, okay, so this sets the scene. Let's, let's get some background here. First of all, it is the Sabbath day, so it's Saturday. Uh, and this is kind of a colorful picture. As you can see, Jesus and the disciples passing through the cornfields this, this day. And the, and the uh, disciples are... Doing what as they go through the cornfields? Yeah, they're taking ears off some of the corn stalks so that they can then take the kernels off and eat them for food. Uh, it doesn't say here that they ate it, but it does say in Luke, the same account, that they ate the corn. We know that also from Luke, as we looked at last week, this was the second Sunday after the Passover, so we know it was kind of the spring of the year. Uh, but again, uh, as you see at the beginning of verse 24, the Pharisees said unto him. So the Pharisees are watching him as, as Jesus and the, his disciples go through the cornfields. They're watching him, and they notice that they are plucking ears of corn and eating them. Now, is that a sin? No. Okay, we're going to look at that in the Old Testament. Uh, was that a sin to go through a cornfield and pluck the ears of corn to eat them? Uh, because that's uh, one of the questions we have to ask. Is that what they're going to try to pin a sin on Jesus for, for doing? Uh so let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's go back to the book of Leviticus and see what it says about this. Leviticus 19. <coughs> Leviticus 19, verse 9. Everybody have that? 
begins, and when ye reap, okay, and when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. What's the gleanings? Yeah, just, just the stuff that falls off. You don't, it's too invaluable to worry about. Uh, verse 10, And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. Okay. What is God saying there to anybody that farms? Leave part of your crops for somebody. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just a, uh, we're not talking about a sin to, to, to go through a, a field and, and uh, pick up the leftovers. It's actually sin if you don't allow that. Okay. Let's go also to uh, another verse here in Leviticus chapter 23. Verse 22. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. Very similar to the previous verses we looked at, right? So again, it's, it's not a sin to go through a field after the harvest and eat the leftovers that the farmer left, in fact, God commands that, okay? So that's not the sin here. It's not the eating or the plucking of the grain. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23. Last verse of this chapter, verse 25. When thou comest into the standing corn of thy neighbor, then thou mayest pluck the ears with thine hand, but thou shalt not move a sickle unto thy neighbor's standing corn. What does that mean? Don't, yeah, don't go and harvest your neighbor's crop. That's what? Stealing. That's stealing. But just coming in and taking a few grains after the harvest is over is not stealing, is what God is saying there, Okay. So God makes it pretty clear what's stealing and what's not. What's a sin and what's not in regard to the crops in the field. God permitted the plucking of a few ears of corn as you pass through somebody else's field. But you don't go in and harvest his field. <laughs> That's stealing. Okay. Big difference. Okay, with this in mind, let's go back to Mark 2. Because the issue now is not eating the corn. The issue now becomes what? Yeah, this is what they keep focusing in on. The Pharisees keep focusing in on with Jesus. He doesn't observe the Sabbath as they defined it. As they defined the third commandment. Not as God defined it. As they in their 50 volume set of rules defined it their traditions, their man-made laws. Okay, uh, so here we have the Sabbath day. Now, I, I just want to remind you that in the Old Testament, up until Jesus uh, ascended into heaven, the Old Testament was in effect. The Old Testament... Uh, ceremonial laws that we just, and political laws that we just read, for example, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, were in effect, okay? But those ceased when Jesus came and then died for our sins, rose from the dead, and ascended. That ceased. Those, those Old Testament ceremonial laws, we are no longer under. Now, under the Old Testament ceremonial laws, the Sabbath day was the seventh day of the week, which we call Saturday, okay? But that ended when Jesus came. 
And the Bible in the New Testament clearly states that no man judge you in regard to a Sabbath day or any holy day. Those were Old Testament, for the Old Testament believers. So we're no longer under the restriction of Saturday being the Sabbath day or being the day of rest or the day that we worship and gather together around God's word. But the key event of the history of the world is Jesus rising from the dead. Because if he be not raised, as the Bible says, our faith is in vain. We are of all men most to be pitied, believing in a dead man. But indeed, he is raised, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, and uh, our faith is not in vain, our sins are forgiven, Jesus is God, he has saved us, heaven is ours as a free gift. So, uh, the Sabbath day now, uh, the New Testament says, is gone in so far as it is a certain day that you rest. But both the Old and New Testament says that we must observe God's word. We must hear it and learn it and keep it. That's now the meaning of the third commandment in the New Testament sense. Doesn't matter if we do it on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday, but we do it on Sunday because of the resurrection of Jesus. That proves everything. He is God. He is the promised Savior of the Old Testament. Uh, he is our Lord and Savior. And therefore, because this now becomes the key event in the faith of every Christian, that they base their whole future, their hope, their life on, is that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. They decided... Let's now worship instead of on Saturday. Let's gather together for worship on Sunday morning because that's when Jesus rose from the dead. And that's how it's been ever since. That's why we're here today on Sunday instead of yesterday, Saturday. We all understand that now. When we talk about the Sabbath day, the third commandment is still in force. But it's not in regard to a certain day of the week. It's simply a rule that we gather together with fellow believers around God's word and sacraments. Lord's Supper and Baptism. Okay. That's right. And they still go to the Old Testament. That's right. That still on that. Uh, well, some, to some degree, yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I say it. it, it <laughs> you know, n next Sunday, my sermon is going to lead off with all the differences in the so-called Christian churches. Sure. Some teach this, some teach that, some teach this, and same way with the Jews. You got everything from Orthodox to freewheeling among Judaism. And some would be strict about that, and others would just say, oh, we can do anything we want on Saturday. Sure. As long as we do something on Hanukkah or something like that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so like it is in, in, in outward Christianity, Christendom, you, you got everything going on, which is very confusing to the heathen, by the way. That's why it's such an abomination to God. That we can't stick to God's word alone. But you got the same thing among the Jews. The, the religious Jews. Really, Judaism today is more of a, an ancestral thing rather than a belief. I, I was conceived and born a Jew, so I'm a Jew. <laughs> that, that decided it for me right there. That's right. That, that's right. And, and, and we are God's chosen people simply by birth. And uh, that's what they trust in. And that's certainly what the Pharisees trusted in as you read through the Gospels. Sure. So I just want to point out a few, of, a few verses here that show you in the New Testament 
that the Sabbath is no longer, or the third commandment no longer regards Saturday, the day of the week. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 20. Verse 7. 7. 27. Acts 20, verse 7. Everybody have that? And upon the first day of the week, not the seventh, not the last day, but upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, meaning the Lord's Supper, Paul preached unto them, that's the word of God, ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. You talk about a long sermon. But that's that's worship. That's gathering together for worship. And when did they do it? On Saturday? Yeah, yeah, Sunday, first day of the week. You can see now how it had shifted because of the resurrection of Jesus. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 16. Verse 1. 1 Corinthians 16, 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, in other words, fellow believers, the the believers in Christ, they're taking them a collection because some of them were undergoing some some hardships and they needed help from the other Christians elsewhere around. So they'd take up a special offering to help out these uh, tormented believers somewhere else. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, that's part of Asia Minor, even so do ye. Upon when? The first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. What does that mean? What, is, what was part of their worship? Taking up the offering, the collection, as it says in verse 1. We do the same thing today just like they did 2,000 years ago. Uh, And they did it uh, on the uh, first day of the week. Uh, And when it says at the end of verse 2, that there be no gatherings when I come, that's the Apostle Paul. (laughs) He's writing to the Corinthians in anticipation of his coming back to Corinth. He says, don't wait till I come to take up this offering that I can then take to the other needy brethren elsewhere. Do it every first day of the week when you gather together and bring your offerings. Okay? Everybody clear so far? Let's go to the last book of the Bible. What's that? Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1, now I think we can understand verse 10. I, who's the I here, do you know? John the Apostle, right, Apostle John, the last apostle to depart this world. He was a young man when he first became an apostle. He's a young man, it says. Well, he's old now, and it's, it's about 100 A.D., and he's, uh, as it says here, he's a prisoner for the faith on the island of Patmos. In verse 9, it explains that. Anyway, he says in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Of course, that's Jesus. So he's, he's a vision He was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. What does that mean? Well, it's the Lord's Day. Yeah, it's Sunday. He's worshiping, even though he's by himself. I don't know. There's probably no other Christians with him. We don't know. But even if he was alone, he worships on Sunday, the Lord's Day, and he's in the Spirit. In other words, he's uh, being guided by the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. Uh, 
Now, of course, being an apostle, he was guided in a special way. And that's why he could write the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation. This is all the work of the Holy Ghost. But also, we're all in the Spirit when we come to worship. Because that's, the Spirit brings us here, the Spirit is in us, and the Spirit is coming to us when we gather together in word and sacrament. So we're in the Spirit on the Lord's Day when we gather to worship, or even if we worship alone. Everybody got that? I'm simply showing you this to prove that in the New Testament era, the Sabbath is no longer a certain day of the week. It is any time you want to make it. And there's other passages we can look at in the New Testament to prove this, but we won't take the time. But that's why in your catechism, when it explains the third commandment, it doesn't say you must rest on Saturday. Now, there's some churches today, some Christian churches, that still teach that. Of course, you've got the Seventh-day Adventists. They're not even Christian. But you've got others, like the Presbyterians, certain Presbyterians, certain Baptists. They, they still say that you shouldn't do any work on Saturday. They're kind of like the Pharisees. And they, they deny these verses in the New Testament that say there is no more rest day they're simply a day that we should gather together as a church and worship. But they, you know, they, they, they would condemn people for working on Saturday. You're not mowing your grass on Saturday. Oh, you shouldn't do that. It's the Sabbath. Or you shouldn't uh, go to work you know, on, on the Sabbath uh, for your employment or something like that. And it's not a sin to work on Sunday. There used to be, and I think Terry and I both can remember our days of our youth when many stores were closed on Sunday. They had the blue laws, they called them. And nobody was to do any shopping on Sunday. Well, that was kind of a misinterpretation of the third commandment. Um, the, the, the thrust of the third commandment now in the New Testament there is get together and worship God by gathering together with your fellow believers and uh, confessing your sins, singing praises to God, hearing a sermon, hearing a Bible class, studying God's word, let God speak to you, then you speak to him in your prayers, you receive the Lord's Supper, you baptize, you know, that you, that you gather together and do these things. That's the third commandment now. Not what day you can't work on. So if you review your catechism in regard to the third commandment, that's the thrust of it. It's hearing God's word. That's the command. And going to church and supporting the church. Bringing your offerings to the church. All those things connected to the church involving the third commandment. Okay, going back then to um, Mark 2. And by the way, you know, the Bible is God's word. He wrote every word of it, and that is our only source and norm of teaching. But we also have writings of other Christians going all the way back to the apostles. Now, they're not inspired. They're not part of the Bible. But they're still interesting to see what other Christians back then and since then have written and said. And you can go all the way back to the first century uh, A.D. and read from these other Christians. And there are references to Sunday being the Lord's Day in their writings. Okay, I don't point them out because they're not in the Bible, but just for your interest, uh, uh, also Sunday being the Lord's Day when they gather together uh, to worship is attested by the writings of Christians of the first century A.D. Okay. Okay. Uh, Let's go back to Mark 2 and again reread uh, verses 23 and 24. 
And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day. And his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they... Why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? Okay, they're breaking the law, the law of God is what they're being accused of. They're sinning and uh, they're, they're accusing Jesus as their leader of allowing sin. He's teaching his disciples to sin is what they're accusing him of. They're really going after Jesus. They're not going after the disciples. Uh, they want to get Jesus out of the way, and then they figure the disciples will disperse. <clears throat> now, is Jesus kind of on guard to say, well, let's, let's don't do that, the Pharisees are watching? Does he care if the Pharisees are watching? No, no he doesn't care. Let them watch. I've got nothing to hide. So he doesn't avoid them. In fact, he loves them. He doesn't love their teachings. He doesn't love their unbelief. But he loves them, and he wants them to convert, as he does all people. He would have all men to be saved, come into the knowledge of the truth. So he's not avoiding them. And he knows everything. He knows that they are watching him. He knows what's in their thoughts. Uh, he knows that they're listening to him, that they're spying on him. In fact, he wants them to. He's glad they're not ignoring him. <laughs> okay? Uh, he's got their attention. So he can teach them. Who does Jesus want to listen to him? Everyone. Everyone. Yeah, he, everyone. Christ, Christ's word is for everybody. We don't hide it from anybody. God would have all people hear his word. How does he want them to hear it? With an open heart and an open mind, carefully. Not coming at it with some hatred of it and a, a, a preconceived bias against it. But you know, he was constantly saying, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's, it's, it's the way we are saved. It's the way the Holy Ghost comes to us and brings us to faith and converts us. It's through his word. So uh, Jesus didn't hide his word from the Pharisees. He's not trying to hide from them. Uh, he wants to teach them. He wants them to learn from him. Uh, how else would the Pharisees come to know that they're wrong? Who else are you going to tell them? Nobody. Who else uh, will teach them the truth if Jesus doesn't? Well, nobody can because if that man told him when his eyes were sealed, he said, you know, be glad and you can't be bad. Mm -hmm. Why? Be with him. Yeah. And yeah. then you run out of church. That's right. Uh, so if if Jesus doesn't tell them, who will? You know, the truth. And they, Jesus, God wants them to hear the truth so that they may, be, may repent. Uh, let's go to chapter 4 for a minute here in Mark. And verse 21, something that Jesus said here. Mark 20, or Mark 4.21, Mark 4.21. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? What's he talking about here? Yeah, the truth of God, the truth of the Bible, the truth of his word. He says, God didn't put this light into this sin-darkened world to be hidden, that we hide it under a, a, a bushel basket or a, under the bed. But we put it on a candlestick so that it'll bring light to people in darkness. Verse 22, For there is nothing hid 
which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. So he's saying, keep listening to the word of God. And the more you hear, the more you'll want. The more you'll hear. It builds. But on the other hand, if you reject it, if you refuse to hear, even what you have will be taken away. You'll end up with nothing. But you know, he came to teach first for three and a half years and then die. Rise again for our sins. But first to teach the word. And he wants anybody and everybody to hear it, even the Pharisees. So he's not hiding from them. And he's not sinning here. He's not breaking the Sabbath. And so they think that they've got him in a sin, but he knows it's not. And he's going to try to uh, bring them to the truth of that. So they accuse Jesus here. Uh, the key word in verse 24 is lawful. It is not lawful. Now, it depends on whose law you're talking about. Their law. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but that's not God's law, see. And that's, that's the crux of it. Uh, they're trying to teach for doctrines the commandments of men, which Jesus accused them of. Uh, you, you worship God in vain if you do that, he says. Your worship is nothing if, if you go by man's teachings. But your worship is pleasing to God if you go by his word, the Bible. Okay, so here they're trying to accuse Jesus and his disciples of sin. Not lawful. That's the key. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left. Let's go back and to the book of Exodus, because this is where, you know, the Old Testament uh, is where we get these laws a lot that, they, that they're bringing up as being lawful or not. And again, the, the law that they're referring to here is what? Yeah, it's the Sabbath day. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Thou shalt sanctify the holy day. So let's go back to Exodus 20. There's two places where the Ten Commandments are all listed together. One is in Exodus 20, the other is in Deuteronomy 5. But let's go to Exodus 20. And here we see the, the law that the Pharisees claim Jesus is breaking. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Ten. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor uh, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. And the very word Shabbat in Hebrew means rest. All right. So that's one of the ver uh, verses, one of the laws they're referring to, the uh, third commandment as it reads there. Let's go to chapter 16 of Exodus. And we have, will not be able to finish this, but we can get started on it. Exodus 16, verse 1. This is during the Exodus where the Israelites are being led by God through Moses out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. And they, the Israelites, took their journey from Elam. And all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the... Fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. 
And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. In other words, at least we had food. We were slaves, but we had food. Would that we had stayed in Egypt, because here we're dying of hunger. Four, then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them, whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At even then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Okay, we're out of time, but you can see what he's getting at here in the, in the verse 5. And he'll emphasize this more than the rest of the chapter, which we'll read later. But they were to go out and collect double on the sixth evening, so that they wouldn't have to do it on the seventh day wouldn't have to go out and work for their food, picking it up off the ground, this manna uh, in the wilderness. So these are the laws that the Pharisees think that they're being so godly by upholding with Jesus and his. But they're just ignorant. They're just ignorant. They're sinful ignoramuses. And Jesus is going to try to set them straight. Shall we close with a benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all. Amen.